Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Municipalities of Saskatchewan Candidate School for Resort Villages. I want to thank everyone for attending, and it's great to have you here today. We're going to start today's presentation by having you fill out the following poll. Uh, just give it a minute here, and it'll be popping up on your screen any second. To answer this, it's very simple. You just click on the buttons and then at the bottom, you'll see a submit button and you hit enter. We'll just give Katie a couple minutes to collect the poll results and then we will move on with today's presentation. Perfect. And while we're waiting for the poll to uh, conclude, I'm just going to go over some housekeeping items. Uh, Municipalities of Saskatchewan uses the Zoom platform. As you can see, all of the icons today will be found at the bottom of your screen. You have your audio settings at the bottom left of your screen. And if you're having problems with the audio on your computer, you can always use this setting to switch over to phone audio. You have the Q&A for questions. Please note that you have the choice to send your questions anonymously and the questions can only be viewed by us, the panelists. You also have your chat for comments and conversation, and you can send the comments to the panelists or to all panelists and all attendees. We also have the raise hand function, which is going to be used by us if we experience any technical difficulties or need any last minute feedback. I'd like to thank our webinar sponsor today, Brownlee. Thanks to Brownlee's sponsorship, we're able to offer this session to you for free. I'd now like to hand it over to Derek King, who's going to talk a little bit about Brownlee. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, again, uh, welcome to Municipal Governance 101 for Resort uh, Villages. Um, we're really very pleased to have the opportunity to, uh, to sponsor and participate in this candidate school. Um, so on behalf of my partners and my associates of the uh, Brownlee Municipal Law Group, um, I want to thank everybody for joining us today and, and thank Municipality of Saskatchewan for this opportunity. Um, just for those of you who may not know us, who is Brownlee LLP? Well, we are a municipal law firm. It's what we do. Our clients are municipalities and related municipal organizations. And uh, we've been exclusively representing municipalities for almost 90 years now between Saskatchewan, Alberta, Nunavut, uh, the Northwest Territories and a little bit into the Yukon. So it's kind of the meat and potatoes of what we do. And as a consequence of our very strong relationships with municipalities, we have come to believe very strongly in the importance of periodic proactive education of counselors and prospective counselors with respect to uh, what the actual job entails, what their duties and responsibilities are, where the pitfalls may lie for counselors uh, or prospective counselors when they, when they run for office. Um, in our experience, the most effective way to avoid the pitfalls that can come with elected office, uh, which can undermine effective governance and can uh, damage public trust in their elected officials, and even result in challenges to municipal actions and decision making, is to ensure that councillors have a good understanding of the concepts uh, that are going to be addressed by the, your panelists today. And that's why even as, uh, as a firm ourselves, we have uh, offered for many, many years similar counselor orientation and conflict of interest training seminars uh, for our client municipalities, because it's just so important to avoiding, uh, well, to ensuring that people understand what it is they're getting themselves into when they run for office and ensuring that once elected, they act in a manner that is consistent with public expectation and with the, the legislation. Uh, in particular, as a lawyer that's had uh, the unfortunate duty uh, of assisting councils in navigating through uh, conflict of interest situations, uh, challenges uh, to decision making as a consequence where there's been councillors acting uh, outside of the scope of the legislation, applications for disqualification, and even the imposition of sanctions. Uh, I can tell you that it's, it's not a pleasant experience for anyone, uh, not for the councillors that are subject to challenge, not for their colleagues on council, and certainly not for administration and the public. So. These education sessions are, are absolutely invaluable in our opinion. Uh, they're powerful, powerful and invaluable tools for councils and prospective council members to understand uh, what, uh, what is uh, the job entails and, and how to ensure that 
you are as effective as possible as an elected representative uh, when you step into that council chamber and take your seat. So I'm looking forward to the presentations today. And again, I, uh, I'm very pleased to have had the opportunity to sponsor this event uh, so that we can offer it for free to, to our attendees today. So without further ado, I will stop talking and let uh, our, our panelists get on to educating you. Thank you. Perfect. Um, so I'm just going to stop sharing my screen now and give Megan the chance to get her screen up on there. Uh, it's also my pleasure to introduce today's presenters. Megan Istas is the Municipal Advisor from the Advisory Services and Municipal Relations Branch in the Ministry of Government Relations. Before joining the Government of Saskatchewan, Megan spent eight years as an RM Administrator in Southeast Saskatchewan. She obtained her certificate in local governance authority from the U of R in 2011. And in 2019, she received her A-class certificate from the Royal Board of Examiners. This summer, Megan will be enjoying, enjoying her summer holidays with her family, settling into her new home. Our next panelist is Yvonne Jess. She holds an advanced certificate in local governance authority and has 22 years experience in the field. She is currently the administrator for the village of Elbow and the resort village of Minnesota Stoon, having worked for two municipalities in the last 19 years. We also have Linda Anweiler, who will be answering your Q&A questions and has been a counselor for the resort village of Melville Beach. In her beautiful Coppell Valley for the last four years, uh, she spent her time as a counselor. She will speak about her experiences coming from a small resort village as a seasonal resort resident and she is also the second vice president with Parks for the last three years. Linda is currently retired from the government of Saskatchewan where she worked for 37 years. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Megan to get the presentation started. Hi everyone. Uh, thank you again for the invitation and the nice introduction, Sean. Um, as Sean mentioned, I am the Municipal Advisor with the uh, Advisory Services and Municipal Relations Branch with the Ministry of Government Relations. And what I hope to do today is just to basically provide a high level um, explanation to give you a better understanding of what to expect and what would be expected of you if you were elected to a Municipal Council. So let's move along. As I said, it'll be a, or our, our overview will cover uh, municipal government, the foundations, so the purpose, services, and authority of municipal government. We'll talk about also the roles and responsibilities, so the roles of elected officials, the administrator, and voters. And uh, we'll also cover procedures, so decision making, council procedures, bylaw, as well as closed sessions. So without further ado, let's start with municipal government and the municipal purpose and uh, services and authority to govern. So the Municipalities Act is the provincial legislation that creates municipalities. It also provides municipalities with their legislative framework to govern. Oh, sorry guys, I realize I might need to back up. My apologies. So, you heard me, of course. Here's really the first slide that you're gonna have to start paying attention to. So, as I was saying, Municipalities Act is the provincial legislation that creates municipalities and provides them with that legislative framework to govern. So the purpose of a municipality is to provide good government, to provide services and facilities that Kill feels are necessary and desirable for all or part of the municipality, uh, develop and maintain a safe and viable community, foster economic, social, and environmental well being, and provide wise stewardship of public assets. Municipalities have natural person powers, and uh, what that means is that a municipality has the same privileges as a natural person and can exercise actions that are not explicitly set out in legislation. So um, a good example is that levy taxes is not a natural person power because that is set out in the legislation. As much as you would love as an individual to tax somebody else, you don't have that authority. 
But overall, and something that I hope that you take away from this presentation today is that municipalities are level of government. So what I'd also want to cover is just a general overview of the municipal services. So each piece of the pie is represented by the different services that you would be responsible for uh, being elected to office. So the general, general government, protective services, things like your RCMP, fire protection, and so on, transportation, uh, your streets, roads, alleys, um, environmental and public health, garbage disposal or recycling, things like that, planning and development, in addition to recreation. Each piece of the pie gets a piece of the budget. So something also to consider when you get elected to office is how are you going to allocate funds appropriately for those different pieces of the pie um, and what is expected by your, by your citizens. So when we talk about authority to govern, the municipality sets out, or municipalities act, MA sets out the municipality's powers and duties. Throughout the legislation, there are um, points that say shall, as well as may. So whenever a statement is made in the act that says shall, it obligates council to act. These are non-negotiable. And an example would be is that um, council shall conduct their meetings in public. May is empowering. So you may choose to do something, you may choose not to do that thing. But whatever council decides to do or not to do, you have to be prepared for the question why, because the act also states that council is accountable to the electors. When it comes to decisions, municipalities are required to act through council decisions. They're required to be made by either resolution or a bylaw, and they're to be made, like I said, at a public meeting. Individual council members do not have legislative authority. Uh, the only case that, that may happen is uh, if council delegated the authority to an individual council member and that delegation would be done through a resolution or in the appropriate case, a bylaw. So moving on to roles and responsibilities, we'll talk about the role for council members, the administrator, as well as the public or voters or citizens. Um, but let's first start with looking at an organizational structure. So as it shows on the slide, this is one model. However, there are others that exist and ultimately would be determined by your municipality. But what's important to note in this example is that the public is at the top because really, as I said in an earlier slide, the public is who the mayor and as well as boards and committees are accountable to. Below that, you'll see that the administrator um, is accountable to the mayor and councillors, and the foreman and staff to the administrator. Again, this is one example. Uh, legislation does not describe how your municipality is set up. It's up to your municipality to determine that. But you'll find that there's a lot of information about municipal governance, and it often discusses the drawbacks of elected officials being part of that, the municipal operations. So once we talk a little bit more about the role of a council member, that might become a little bit more clear. So as it comes to elected officials, um, all members of council have the following, represent, or following responsibilities. They are to represent the public and to consider the well-being and interests of the municipality. They're to participate in developing and evaluating policies, services, and programs of the municipality. They're to participate in council meetings and council committee meetings and, the, and any other meetings of bodies that they are appointed to. They're to ensure administrative practices and procedures are in place to implement the decisions of council confidence the matters that are discussed in private or to be discussed in private at a council or council committee meeting. We're going to talk about that at the end of the presentation. And that is supposed to be kept until it is a meeting that is held in the public, maintain the financial integrity of the municipality, and to perform any or duty or function that is imposed by any act 
or by the council. So in the yellow box, you see council equals decision makers. So they are responsible for making the decisions that affect the municipality. They are not responsible for the operations or administrative procedures. That's the administrator's role where we're gonna get into that. But they set the stage for what is to be carried out for the municipality within their scope of um, what the act requires and their own bylaws. So when elected to office, each member of council is required to complete the oath of, oath of office before the first meeting of council. If it's a by-election, um, it can be completed any time after being elected, it just has to be done prior before, prior to carrying out any powers or duties or functions of that office. The older affirmation of office is required under the Municipal Act. And what it speaks to is that as an elected member that you're qualified to hold office, that you have not and will not receive payment or reward for any corrupt practice, that you've read and understood the code of ethics, the rules of conduct and procedures applicable, and that you promise to perform the duties of office, that you will disclose any conflict of interest within the context of the Municipalities Act, and you'll also comply with the Code of Ethics, Rules of Conduct, and Procedures as the Act and, or as per the Act and by the Council. So in that previous slide, I made a statement about disclosing uh, any conflict of interest. So, this is where your public disclosure statement would come into play. A public disclosure statement identifies employment, financial interests, business interests, and property holdings of the person and of the person's family. So starting this year for general elections, this public disclosure statement must accompany your nomination paper when you run for office. If you are elected, you would need to complete that form again within 30 days. Uh, as elected, each year for your term, you will require to um, do an annual declaration by November 30th. And if you do have any uh, major changes, you just amend it within 30 days. Public disclosure statements are also publicly accessible. So when you submit your nomination papers, it'll be hung up with your nomination paper in the municipal office. And then again, if elected, uh, a member of the public can come and ask to see that. Important to note um, that a public disclosure statement identifies financial interests. It doesn't identify financial amounts. So something to be clear on if you have questions about that document. So moving along conflict of interest. So when we talk about conflict of interest, it's important to understand that it can and is almost likely to exist, but it's Existence is not evidence of wrongdoing. Uh, what is important is that the, the process in handling a conflict of interest, that that process is followed. As you can see on uh, the right hand side of the screen, I have a yellow box and it says declare, disclose, abstain, refrain, and leave. So if a matter comes before council and it is something that you would have a conflict of interest on, the process would be as this. You declare that you have that conflict before any consideration on that matter. You would disclose what that conflict is and why and how it might affect your impartiality. You would abstain from voting on that question, a decision, recommendation, or other action that council is considering about the matter. You'll refrain from participating in any discussion on that matter and leave the room until the discussion and voting on the matter has concluded. Some important things to remember is that any matter that comes before council that involves what you have listed on your public disclosure statement is a conflict of interest. And as a member of council, it would be your responsibility to follow the process for handling your conflict, starting with declaring. If a contravention occurs, it can be handled under the municipality's code of ethics bylaw, which we're going to discuss in the next slide. So, the 
the Code of Ethics Bylaw essentially defines how council members behave with each other, employees, and the public that uses the model Code of Ethics that's under the municipalities of regulations. Now, um, the municipalities reg regulations describes at a minimum what is expected. Your municipality may also include other items uh, within their Code of Ethics bylaw. So from the municipalities regs, um, we talk about honesty. Council members must be truthful and open. Objectivity. Decisions must be made carefully, fairly, and impartially. Respect. So everyone, including other members, need to be treated with dignity, understanding, and respect. Transparency and accountability. Council business should be conducted so that citizens will be able to clearly see how and why a decision was made, what information, advice, and consultation council considered, and which legislative environments were followed. Confidentiality. So confidential information that is learned while in office must be kept private. And as a member of council, you should not benefit from information that you learned in fulfilling your role as an elected official. Leadership and public interest. So serving your citizens in the best interest of the municipality to build the public's trust and confidence and responsibility. Acting in accordance with legislation, disclosing a conflict of interest and following the policies and procedures of your municipalities. So all Saskatchewan municipalities are required to have this bylaw that includes the model code of ethics as I just described, but it also requires to have a process for dealing with alleged contraventions. So as I mentioned earlier, if a conflict of interest was not handled in the correct manner, a complaint may be filed under your code of ethics bylaw. So when we look at those three together and we tie it all back, public disclosure statements are a mechanism for the public to hold their elected council members accountable. So ensuring that council members are making decisions in the best interest of the municipality versus their own interests. You do have a conflict of interest with anything or everything, sorry, that is listed on your public disclosure statement. The Code of Ethics bylaw requires that you declare conflict of interest and this may include conflicts that are not on your public disclosure statement. When you decide to run for municipal office, you accept the duty to act in the municipality's best interests and without private or perceived interests affecting your decision making. There will be, like I said before, likely a time sooner or later during your term of office when a matter is before council in which you have a conflict of interest. It's okay. It, it happens just handle it in a proper way. So moving along, um, next is important to speak to the role of the administrator. So the administrator's role is providing the financial management. They advise council on their legislative and operational matters. Uh, and they provide the overall administration of the municipality. Administrators must be qualified as required by the Urban Municipal Administrators Act for resort villages. Um, and if not otherwise provided for by council, the administrator is responsible for hiring, uh, pension and dismissal of all municipal employees. Now, um, administrators are expected to remain impartial in their role as advisors and ensure that the decisions made by their municipal councils are carried out. And you'll see that in the yellow box. So if you remember from earlier on in the presentation and talking about the role of elected officials, council as elected officials are the decision makers, the administrator carries out those decisions, whether that be assigning duties to an assistant, the foreman or what have you, it's the administrator's responsibility to have those decisions carried out. Now, lastly, but most importantly, when it comes to discussing the roles and responsibilities, we need to discuss the role of the public. So the Municipalities Act provides the public its own powers to hold their elected officials accountable. So some of those would be the ability to attend to observe meetings of council and council committees, 
uh, access to municipal documents such as minutes, bylaws, audited, fi audited financial statements of the municipality, contracts that may be entered into, the accounts paid, and the public disclosure statements like I mentioned earlier. The public also has the ability to petition for a public meeting of the voters to discuss a municipal matter. They can petition to have a referendum or referendum, sorry, um, or even special audits. So a financial audit or even a management audit. So unofficially, and this is, um, it's not stated in the legislation specifically, but talking to their elected officials. So informally, you could probably expect to be stopped at the post office or getting groceries or on the street with uh, a member of the public to have a question, that has a question or a concern, or they can formally um, request to be a presenter at your council meeting or a delegate and submit questions or concerns in writing. A key part of that is always ensuring um, Fairness. So although they may present a concern uh, and council may decide otherwise and they may not be happy with what you decide, it's important that you respond to that inquiry. Like I said in a, multiple times, council is accountable to the public. That's who is electing them. So the last part of the the over or the presentation today will talk about procedures. So decision making, council procedures, bylaw, and closed sessions. So decisions again, they're by resolution or in the form of a bylaw. Um, we recommend to establish policies for administrative and operational matters that are either in the form of a bylaw or resolution. Because at the end of the day, all decisions are to be made by council in an open public meeting. Something that we hear about often is what about text message decisions or email decisions that are occurring in between meetings. Decisions such as these would be contravening legislation because like I've said before, decisions are to be made in an open public meeting. In most cases, those decisions tend to be on the administrative or the operational side of things for matters that come up in between those meetings. So when that is the case, establish a policy in either the form of a resolution or a bylaw that provides that direction for the administrator to carry out. Uh, this not only complies with legislation, but also provides transparency, consistency, and fairness for the public. So a council procedures bylaw. Uh, many of you may be familiar with parliamentary procedures or Robert's Rules of Order from other boards or committee experience that you may have. Uh, when it comes to municipalities, they're required to have their own council procedures bylaw, which may be based off of those others or tie certain parts in, but it's ultimately a council procedures bylaw provides the direction of how municipal council meetings are conducted. And every municipality in Saskatchewan is required to have this. So some of the matters that would be included or could be included within that council procedures bylaw is setting the parameters for how a person can be added to the agenda to present to council. Could be that they require to contact the municipal office uh, 24 hours ahead of time before the meeting. Maybe a form is required uh, to register as a delegate. It will also identify the process for motions uh, and define the proper conduct for elected officials and public at council meetings. It'll also, or it can, include the rules regarding meetings through electronic means. Um, so just to elaborate a little bit more on that, the Municipalities Act, and this is a May statement, says council may uh, conduct their meetings through electronic means. And there are certain conditions with that. But that being said, your council may determine to include within your council procedures, bylaws, rules, of how, uh, rules around electronic meetings whether the council member needs to register with the administrator so many days ahead of time, or um, how many may be on electronic means at that time. So those are things to consider. And if elected, reviewing that council procedures bylaw not only is required because it's part of what you're swearing to in your oath of office that you're familiar with the procedures, but it gives you that understanding of what to expect of how those meetings are to be conducted. 
So the last part about decision making or procedures that I'd like to talk to is closed sessions. So these are sometimes referred to as in camera sessions. Um, but essentially it closes the meeting or a portion of the meeting to the public for discussion purposes only because decisions cannot be made during this time. Um, discussions that are held during a closed session, they are confidential. So um, the purpose is to really discuss only matters that turn long range strategic planning that's straight out of the legislation or are covered under privacy legislation that the municipalities are bound by. This includes, but is not limited to things like legal advice or employee matters or personnel matters. Governance dialogue ought to be visible to the community that is served. And it's better to err on the side of openness and transparency, but your council may also decide to consider establishing rules that apply to closed session uh, deliberations and reporting such results. So I realized that was a really quick and high level overview. There's a lot of things to know about being on municipal government. Um, we have a lot of resources on Saskatchewan.ca, one of which is the council members handbook. Um, there's also municipal leadership development program that I believe is six modules that different areas of expertise. I believe that talks about human resources, public relations, um, development and so on. So that's a great uh, avenue to explore if you're elected to council to better add to your, uh, your briefcase. <laughs> um, the next one is 10 minute trainers to assist well on council. The peer network also available to you, which is a, it's a group of current uh, administrators as well as elected officials to reach out to, uh, to get some advice. If you're unsure of um, a matter that's before council and decision to be made, you can always reach out to them. Uh, their calls are confidential. The Ombudsman Saskatchewan, as well as the Office of the Saskatchewan Information and Privacy Commissioner, they're both independent bodies. Ombudsman uh, receives complaints from people who feel that they've been treated unfairly by their municipality, but they also provide resources um, for council members to better understand the rules around conflict of interest. Um, when it comes to the privacy commissioner, they resolve access and privacy just that are between individuals and public bodies, including municipalities, and uh, they investigate and resolve privacy complaints. But they also too have a, many resources available to you to help you within your role if elected council. And lastly, um, you can call us. Advisory services is, um, our calls are confidential. We provide the technical legislative advice related to municipal governance. Um, so as Sean stated in my introduction, I am a former administrator for in the rural municipal world. Um, so that experience and the time here has really given us a um, good breadth of knowledge of the legislation that municipalities are required to abide by. Before I turn it over, um, I'm just quickly go over the general election information for this year. So if you haven't already uh, submitted your nomination papers, the deadline to do so is July 25th in the hours of 11 a.m. and 2 p.m. Nomination, nomination papers can be dropped off prior to this date during the regular office hours for your municipality. So make sure to check the notices or contact the office to uh, confirm what method or what days are available and what even methods they are, can accept in receiving the nomination papers. Um, election day is August 29th, 2020. Uh, polling hours are 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. and they may open earlier. So this was by minister's order to delay the date to August 29th, as I'm sure you're all aware. And it did extend the hours that they have to open at 8 a.m. and they will close at 9. Um, within that minister's order, municipalities are encouraged to offer an advanced polar mail-in ballot system. Um, and reach out to your municipality to confirm what options are available to your voters. Um, as I did the plug for advisory services, if you have additional questions, here is our contact information. 
you can reach uh, our any advisor by calling 787-2680 or uh, more information like I said can be found on saskatchewan.ca and just type in municipal elections or whatever the topic may be into the search bar you may also email us at muninfo at gov.sk.ca. And there, I will take pass it along back to Sean. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you, Megan. That was a really great presentation. And uh, I hope that everyone was able to find some useful information in that. Uh, next, I'm going to hand it over to Yvonne Jess, who is going to go through some of the unique challenges that you should be aware of in a resort village. So let me just get my screen pulled up here. And you should be seeing that now. And take it away, Yvonne. Okay, thanks, Sean. Um, so I was asked today um, by Parks to, to speak briefly about some of the unique challenges that resort village council sometimes deal with. And Sean is going to be my Vanna White here, so you can click on the first one here. So I'll start with what's probably obvious, but some new council members are sometimes surprised to find out that a resort village actually operates all year, not just during cabin season. A resort village is a municipality, just like a town, village, or RM. Obviously, it's often less busy over the winter months, but those months are often used for budgeting and planning policy and bylaw review, etc. There's always something going on. And with, with technology, and if you have the provision for this in your council procedure bylaw, you can have the option to hold meetings electronically. This works well if you have council members who aren't able to attend in person. We've used a conference call system or just like this over Zoom and it works quite well. Uh, the next point. If you have a mixture of full-time and seasonal residents, balancing the needs and wants of both can sometimes be a challenge. It's definitely something to be aware of when considering your level of service, snow removal, garbage throughout the winter, water and sewer if your resort village provides those services, communication, staffing, council meetings, they're all things to consider. So finding the balance between that level of service that residents expect and want and the level of service you're able to provide can be challenging. Sometimes getting a little creative or thinking outside the box can help with that. The next one, rules. Who hasn't at one time or another thought there are too many rules at the lake? Or I'm not in the city anymore, so I should be able to do whatever I want. I've heard those comments more times than I can count. And that can take up a lot of time at the council table. Fortunately or unfortunately, depending on which opinion you have, even a resort village needs to have rules. Some of those rules come through legislation, which council must follow or pass bylaws in regards to, while other rules for resort villages are more local and flexible and can be set by council through bylaws or policies. This can be a unique situation for resort villages to find that balance that everyone can live with. You want everyone's time at the cabin to be fun and relaxing, but you also have to provide for a safe and viable community. The next one, staffing. Staffing and council roles. So staffing can also be unique, a unique challenge in a resort village. You will often have part-time and seasonal staff because of the largely seasonal nature of your municipality. It will be important for council to know their role and the role of their staff. Sometimes you have to come up with unique arrangements to make things work, but council should not be doing the work of staff. I know in smaller municipalities, this can be tough, whether it's to cut costs or just to help out, it can happen. I'm just saying it shouldn't happen. It can open up a whole can of worms in regards to liability, insurance, workers' compensation, all things like that. Um, the next one, Resort villages sometimes aren't in a position to provide all of the services or infrastructure they need or want on their own. This can be seen as a challenge, but it can also be seen as an opportunity. Cooperation with neighboring urban or rural municipalities can be an opportunity. Communities working together can always do more than working on their own. Hiring a certified administrator can be sometimes 
a challenge for smaller municipalities. An option to look at possibly could be shared administration, which could gain you an educated, experienced administrator. This position is much more than just answering the phones and selling golf passes. And this doesn't necessarily have to mean a joint office, although that could be an option for some. As an example, in our case, I'm the administrator for both the Village of Elbow and the Resort Village of Mistossini. I work full time in mon um, Monday through Friday in Elbow. So obviously I'm not available to work in Mistossini during those times. To make this work, and in order for Mistossini to have their own administration office in their community, which is what they were looking for, um, Mistossini has a part-time admin assistant that works regular office, office hours during doing the frontline work. Then I go out there and do my part on evenings and weekends when needed. It may seem a bit complicated, but we have a system that for the most part works great. Um, other examples of working with neighboring municipalities could be shared services or infrastructure, like fire service agreements, lagoon usage agreements, potable water, garbage, recycling, recreational type things such as swimming lessons. There's lots of opportunities to work together. You just need to be open to explore those. And then the next slide. What advice would you give to someone running for council? So in preparing for this webinar, I'd ask my current Resort Village Council, what advice would they give? And this is what I heard back from them. The first one was, um, the process of having issues addressed and or resolved can be a challenge. It takes longer than I first expected to get things done because of meeting schedules, council availability, staff, budgets, etc. Another comment was running for council with a personal agenda is the wrong reason to run. Be prepared for it to take time to make any changes and be open to the opinions of others. And lastly, be prepared for a pile of information. And I don't think this comment was meant to scare anyone, but it does take time to get up to speed as someone new on council. Take in any training sessions you can, or maybe even start off after the election with a bit of an orientation session with council and administration. Rely on your administration for information. If you don't know something, just ask. Um, if we don't know the answer, we'll usually be able to find it or direct you to someone who does. Take advantage of any educational opportunities. The Municipal Leadership Development Program is great. There are webinars, workshops, and conferences put on by both parks and municipalities of Saskatchewan. And don't forget about networking. Reach out to other resort villages and see what they're doing or how they handle a situation. There's lots of great ideas out there, so don't hesitate to ask. So just in closing, um, serving in an elected position is not easy, but being a member of council can offer a lot of personal satisfaction. Have an open mind, be willing to consider the opinions of others. Consider serving on council as an opportunity to help shape the future of your resort village. Thank you. Perfect. And that brings us into the open forum of uh, section of today's presentation. Um, as we move into the q and I encourage anyone who has any questions of our two presenters or uh, of our council member, Linda, or our lawyer, Derek, uh, to submit them in the Q&A pod. Another option is if you don't know how to word your question and you would like to speak to it, you can always raise your hand and use that function and we will give you uh, the ability to talk. Uh, we will enable that function for you so that you can ask your question directly. I'm just gonna hand it over to Linda as we wait for uh, questions to come in. And uh, just Linda, if you have any uh, thoughts you wanna share around being a counselor and uh, what your experiences were uh, as a first time counselor and lessons you learned from your, uh, your first term, uh, that'd be lovely to hear. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. Um, well, I was brand new four years ago. Um, it's a real, it's been a real learning curve. I would say um, you have to be very patient because there are, you're, there's a wealth of information that you know you have to become familiarized with yourself 
I think um, we have had um, a lot of uh, learning curve with our resort this past four years, but it's been uh, an invaluable, you know, learning information and sharing. And I think it's just trying to, um, your bylaws and all your, um, your bylaws are having to change to look into, to try and, uh, you know, uh, having to enforce bylaws is also a great thing that we have problems with. I'm sure a lot of the resort villages do too. And um, it's, you can make bylaws, but to try and enforce them sometimes is very difficult. <clears throat> I, I just think that um, it's a great experience for anybody and I encourage anybody that's wanting to run to really consider it. Perfect. Um, thank you, Linda. Uh, the other thing, I'll give Derek the opportunity if you have any thoughts about the presentation today uh, that you'd like to share, um, feel free. Yeah, thanks. Um, I thought the presentation was fantastic. Um, really, I think uh, hit all of the highlights uh, that prospective um, elected officials need to think about uh, when making the decision to run for office. Um, you know, we have found that um, on occasion, we've seen that councillors have been presently surprised to discover, as was made, the point was made at the beginning, uh, is that uh, resort villages are, to a great extent, just as busy as any other municipality. Uh, councillors have all the same responsibilities as they do in any other municipality. And, um, and uh, there's some work involved with it. And it can be very rewarding work, but, uh, but there is work. And it's important for resort village uh, council members to, to understand the, the legislative obligations that are imposed upon them and to make sure that uh, they go in with, uh, with their eyes wide open on that. But as I said, most of my clients have, uh, have ultimately found it to be a very rewarding experience. Uh, but if the education sessions uh, like this, I think, are really important to making sure that people understand uh, exactly what they're getting themselves into when they go forward. So I think the presenters were uh, the presenters were excellent on this. So thanks. Perfect. Um, so our first question is for Megan, and then if anyone else has anything to add, they certainly can. Uh, the question is. Due to the concerns around COVID, how can councils use Zoom to hold meetings and remain open to the public and yet allow for closed sessions? Is there a specific bylaw requirement for video meetings such as Zoom? Is there training provided to administrators slash council for using things such as Zoom? And is the public notification and link on the website appropriate and sufficient for this? Okay, so a lot of questions. Uh, I think Yvonne kind of touched a little bit on meeting through electronic means uh, with, with COVID currently. Um, but to kind of elaborate more on remaining open to the public and also closed sessions. So the legislation does not dictate um, what electronic means to have that meeting. So it could be over the phone, it could be through Zoom, could be through other video platforms. Uh, the thing is, is that you would have the administrator would need to look into how, if needing to go into a closed session, they can, uh, I guess, provide those restrictions, so to speak, to turn off the video, turn off the sound, and then resume when that meeting resumes to make a decision. Um, councils also have the ability, either the mayor or a majority of council members, to request a special meeting to be called. And a special meeting uh, requires public notice and within that public notice, identify what the purpose of that meeting is for. If it's for a matter that would be discussed under closed session, they would identify in their public notice that all or part of that meeting would be closed to the public. So that might be another option um, of having a special meeting to address that matter. It depends. Um, as for training specific for things such as Zoom, we do not offer that. Um, it's something that you may look to your associations. I'm not sure if there's guidance from there or uh, on your own in, in contacting those video platforms or meeting platforms that are available to you. I hope that answered that question. Uh, perfect, and uh, I don't know if Linda or Yvonne, you just wanna jump in with your experiences around using Zoom or uh, other uh, platforms for meetings during this time. Well, we've been using Zoom now for approximately, I would say, five months. It's been, um, we've only had our council meetings with it. Um, we haven't had to access it for any public meetings. 
but um, it's gone very well, very well with us um, in terms of um, in terms of being able to still communicate with each other, and um, we find it very beneficial. Perfect. That, um, cool. We've done both Zoom meetings and conference calls, and Zoom meetings are a lot easier to have discussion and see. You can see each other, right? So um, those seem to work better. We give public notice um, that it's going to be held that way, and that if any uh, member of the public wants to join in, they just have to contact the office for the Zoom ID number and password. Um, so we have had delegations. We've had um public join that way too and so far it's been working good yeah sean if i can just add a quick comment there too a, a lot of our i mean every one of our clients is is of course using zoom or some similar platform right now for for meetings and they've been going uh, quite well um the uh, i just wanted to comment on the in-camera portion of it or the you know behind closed doors session um, we've actually found that that actually has worked quite well as well and, and Zoom in particular I think provides a really good mechanism for that in that um, there's the ability uh, if it's set up correctly just to uh, to be able to remove all attendees with the exception of council members and key members of administration back into a lobby where they ha cannot hear uh, the, uh, the session. Um, and uh, I know that we've done that uh, a number of times in council meetings that I've attended for, uh, to provide legal guidance. And it seems to work very, very well. People adapt to it very, very quickly. So um, I think the platform is, works very well and it's completely consistent with section 125 of the act, which sets up the provisions for electronic meetings. Um, like you said, as long as you meet the, uh, the requirement in particular of giving notice to the public, even for a, a regularly scheduled council meeting that it's going to be held by electronic means as opposed to uh, just in regular council chambers, so. Perfect. Um, I'll pose our next question here to Yvonne and then uh, Megan, Derek, or Linda, if you have anything to add, feel free. Um, it says, how can council members work with their work to support their staff, lessen the workloads, ensure that there is adequate mental health in the organization, and provide a harassment-free workplace? Okay, my sound cut out, but I think I found the question you were talking about, Sean. Um, how can council members work to support their staff? I think being aware of the workload and being able to provide any resources that you can to help, um, being aware of the busy seasons, especially in a resort village, um, and during the summer, we just can barely keep up with you know, taxes and building permits and, you know, stuff like that. Um, some of the policy re review and like some of the other stuff that could be, you know, done kind of in the off season or the slower times, just being aware of that. Um, maybe being able to provide some resources, like if you've got a lot of development going on, maybe you hire a planner that deals with that kind of stuff. Um, harassment, that's, <laughs> that's a good one. Um, there's a harassment policy and bylaws that you can put in place. Sometimes enforcing that is difficult, um, especially if it's a member of the public. I have not found a good way to deal with that. But I think overall just supporting your staff. They um, are trying to carry out all the decisions that council has made. So that's all I've got there. Perfect. Uh, Derek, do you have any thoughts? And Derek, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Completely forgot I was on mute. Uh, no, I, I don't have anything else to add. That largely falls into their bailiwick rather than mine. And I tend to get involved only when those kind of balances haven't been achieved in the municipality. Um, no, it was good advice. I don't have anything else to add. Uh, perfect. The one thing I will note is if your municipality doesn't have a harassment uh, policy or template, uh, you can always look to municipalities of Saskatchewan. We actually uh, developed one with legal counsel, which will provide your orga organization a uh, kind of a, a starting point for developing harassment policy in the workplace. And uh, I don't know if 
Uh, Megan or Linda, you have anything to add? If not, we'll move on to the next question. Nope, the other panelists handled it great. Yeah. So that's good. I agree that it was pretty well handled. Perfect. Our next question, um, does your employer need to be aware that you are uh, running to be an elected official? And I guess we'll turn this one over to Megan. So from the Local Government Election Act or the Municipalities Act, it's not a requirement, um, but your employer may require that you disclose if you are uh, serving as an elected official or intend to. Uh, you may need to make arrangements for a leave of absence um, or potentially resigning or what have you. Um, I think that should cover it. There's only certain fields that you would be prevented from uh, serving as an elected member if you were the municipality's solicitor, auditor, or a provincial judge. Uh, just, just to add to that too, there's a practical reason for letting your employer know and that is uh, your, employer, your employer should be aware of potential uh, interests that may come forward from their perspective that could put you in a position as counselor where you need to declare. So if they're a supplier to the municipality, uh, if they're bidding on contracts, things like that, it just, it just makes sense to be upfront with your employer that, uh, that, uh, that you're on council and that you might have to act in a certain manner if their matters come forward so that you can set that expectation up in advance. To add that as well, um, ensuring that your employer is aware is that if you need to make any accommodations for any council meetings um, that you would, or other committee meetings or conventions. So that's an important part to note as well. Perfect. Uh, our next question will be for Linda and then Yvonne if you want to hop in. Um, what can I expect as compensation in a resort community? for uh, being a counselor? <laughs> uh, um, if they're talking about financially, uh, not very much. Um, I don't wanna disclose our, our we are granted um, a very limited uh, monthly allowance, um, but it uh, barely covers your, uh, your photocopy paper and your ink. <laughs> so, but no, I think that one of the, the um, the benefits is that you, I think it's that you can take pride in, in what you have done to help your community. Um, I would say, and just being able to be accessible to people that uh, are wanting to see maybe some changes made and to help maybe implement them, or if you can't implement them, explain why you know, that this is not, uh, you know, that we can't, you know, it can't be done. I think that um, people just want when they, when they see, you know, something happening that they can't, can't be done, they want explanations and we're, we're available to do that for them. Um, also to put forth um, their ideas, you know, of, of how they would like to see, you know, resorts, uh, any changes in the resorts. So um, I would say it's, it's a great opportunity for people. It's a, it's a wonderful learning experience. I mean, I had mentioned I've been with the government for 37 years prior, but this has been one of the uh, most learning experiences. I mean, that you, you are going for a long time because it's, uh, you're dealing with so many things when you're a counselor. To add a little bit to what Linda said, uh, remuneration is set by the Municipal Council. Um, when remuneration is set for um, serving on council, you have to, uh, the municipality has to provide public notice when that discussion is made, whether to change it or if not change it. Um, it can be, it's what is appropriate as de determined by that council. Mm -hmm. It may be a, a lesser amount, it could be higher, but your best, um, your best to direct that question directly to the resort village office and see what the, the remuneration is set as because that is also mm -hmm. public information. It's done by a resolution and would be in uh, council meetings. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, this next question will uh, post to you, Megan. Um, sometimes it appears that the chair of the council, the mayor, takes a bit of uh, time moving along meetings. 
is there precedence to have anyone other than the mayor uh, chairing meetings? Mm -hmm. um, yes, um, it has to be a council the decision to appoint somebody else to chair. Your council procedures bylaw um, will also provide for processes if it's a point of order to direct the chair to move along the meeting or if it's a delegation that's gone too long. But uh, ultimately working together and following that council procedures bylaw is key. Really, it dictates how those meetings are to be conducted. And if the chair is not necessarily following that bylaw, um, look to that bylaw as to what measures are to hold them accountable in, in moving the meeting along. I came from an RM where there was a lot of farming and tire kicking at times. So I understand, <laughs> but it's just the way that it works. <clears throat> Uh, perfect. Anyone else have anything they want to add? Uh, we'll move on to the next question. Um, so the next question I'll just put openly and someone can answer it. Uh, if the code of ethics is not being done well, how would you go about filing a complaint or a petition? I guess we'll direct this to Megan first. So um, the code of ethics that is again addressed under the code of ethics law. It follows the model that is prescribed under the regulations. Again, the municipality may add other items that they feel is important to include in that uh, code of ethics bylaw. But that bylaw will also provide for the process of how to deal with the contravention. So it may be complaint or most likely it's going to be a complaint based uh, situation of having a alleged contravention to the code of ethics. Um, that bylaw would also indicate the investigation process and what if uh, sanctions would be imposed. Um, it's hard to answer specifically because the code of ethics, although everybody has to follow the same basis, each municipality sets out their own process and how to deal with that, that complaint. The important thing to know though is that if you feel that that complaint made against the code of ethics was handled improperly. The next step is the uh, provincial ombudsman. They handle complaints where the public feels that they have been, their concern or their issue hasn't been uh, handled properly or they've been treated unfairly. And, and they may choose to investigate that complaint and they would make recommendations to that municipal council to uh, rectify or resolve that issue. If you would like to discuss it further, you can contact our office. Um, it's, I've provided that number. I, I'll give it to you now. It's 787-2680, and you can speak with any advisor if you want to elaborate a bit more. Perfect. And we'll also make sure that that number is available in the recording email after the fact so that you can find that. Thank you. Our next question is directed towards Yvonne and Linda. Linda, we'll start with you. Um, so the information presented today is a lot uh, directed to councillors. Uh, as a person running for mayor, are there additional items, concerns, or recommendations uh, you would like to highlight? In terms of running for mayor, um, the duties are different from the counselors in, in the sense that um, you are, um, you are, as a mayor, you are, you are not given vote uh, unless it's a stale date and the two count, well, we only have two counselors here and one mayor. So it would only be if the two counselors were at a stale date in a decision and couldn't agree, then the mayor would have a chance to vote. Um, other than that, it's pretty well, everyone has to participate in, in the council meetings, of course, and the decision making. And uh, everyone is given a say. And then of course, the mayor, of course, then is in, he is in charge of, of the, to make sure that the meeting has, has gone well, that, you know, things have, um, the people have been given voice. And to also to, um, to abide by decisions that are made at that meeting. So um, sometimes they might not agree what has been voted on, but that decision has been made and the mayor has to, um, you know, make sure that he's, you know, able to enforce that. 
Does that help? <laughs> Just to chime in, I'm sorry, I don't want to take over. Okay, uh, from yeah. a legislative standpoint, council members as well as mayors have the same responsibilities. There's only a few matters where it's different. Um, or a mayor, or in a case of a RM, a REEV will to the meeting, unless council has decided that somebody else is to chair that meeting and they do that by way of resolution or within a bylaw. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's an unspoken expectation that the mayor is somewhat of the PR person on behalf of council. That may not necessarily be the case. There's also that expectation too that the mayor is responsible, is always going to be the signing authority. That also is not necessarily the case. Uh, a signing authority on behalf of the municipality is uh, appointed by council by way of resolution. So in the grand scheme of things, a mayor and council or a council member to mayor are the same uh, responsibilities um, and actually all members of council do vote the only time that they do not vote is if they are in a position of conflict of interest and they've declared disclosed refrained re or abstained refrained and left um, is where they would not exercise a vote well, i'm glad you raised that megan because that kind of flagged for me as well uh, and I still do see that among certain municipalities that I deal with in various jurisdictions where there's this um, expectation that the, the mayor or reeve doesn't take a, a vote unless there's a tie. And uh, there's very few legislation left in, uh, in Canada actually where that's in fact actually the case. Um, and, I, and I, correct me if I'm wrong, Megan, but I don't think that I've ever seen that in Saskatchewan legislation recently that that would be the case. So if that's a practice, it, it might be an outdated practice that may need to be corrected. Uh, the other thing I would add uh, for people who uh, are planning on running for mayor, um, and this is probably as much for educating your, your supporters as well as yourself, is uh, the mayor is the first among equals. Uh, we don't in, uh, in Saskatchewan or Alberta in, in, or in the territories have an executive branch of government where the mayor is an executive officer and, and the council members are legislative officer or legislative members, um, the first among equals. So, you know, the mayor has one vote. It's basically got the same responsibilities and duties as any other councillor has already has been laid out. And, um, and that's important to know because uh, the public sometimes may think that you have an ability as a, as a mayor to set agendas or, um, or even to make unilateral decisions with respect to municipal operations. And, and that's not the case. The, the mayor, um, you know, the decision making of council is by majority of council and, and not specifically by the mayor. Uh, another thing that can be troublesome for, for people who run for mayor is the public expectation that mayors will get themselves involved in operational level decision making. And that's dangerous conduct. Uh, like any council, the mayor has to stay on the policy side of the decision making process rather than the operational side. Um, so that those decisions uh, and uh, the decision making and the, and the steps taken are valid. Um, and I, I think I'll leave it at that. Perfect. And Yvonne, do you have anything to add? All right, we'll move on to our next question. Um, and this one will likely go to Megan as well. Can council by way of policy or resolution delegate some decision making to the administrator, such as granting development uh, and building permits. Currently, our resort village waits for a meeting to grant these. Um, yes, uh, the simple answer is yes, in um, general circumstances. When it comes to granting development permits, uh, you're best to speak with our community planning branch. They are responsible for the Planning and Development Act that provides the guidance for official community plans and, and zoning bylaws and they'll talk to permitted versus discretionary uses. So I know from experience in most cases, like a permitted use, um, that doesn't require it to go to council when it's under your zoning bylaw. And as for building permits, I would anticipate the same, uh, or I would expect the same type of permission, so to speak, uh, but that would also be better to confirm with the building standards uh, branch of our ministry because they are responsible for the Uniform Building Accessibility Standards Act um, that, again, uh, provides that authority for building permits. So if you need those numbers, give me a call after and I can uh, give them to you.
Perfect. And Yvonne, is an administrator, is there anything uh, you'd like to add or just kind of experience of how that works in your, uh, your resort village? Yeah, we don't wait for a council meeting. I, I, as the development officer, approve those unless it is a discretionary use because then, of course, it has to go to council, the public notice requirement and, and all that. Um, and building permits too. We, as long as it meets, as long as our building official will approve it, then we will. Um, we do, I do get council to pass a motion, like approving them, I guess, and then it shows up in the minutes and then there's a list of them in the minutes. I don't know if that's required or not, but that's what we've always done, so. Uh, perfect. Um, we will move on to our next question, and I believe this one's for Derek, but uh, Megan, feel free to jump in. Um, can you please address the statutory protection against liability of counselors? Um, what other protections exist, including liability insurance? Well, I can't speak to the insurance side. I'll leave that to the administrators uh, to, to speak about the insurance that's put in place uh, because policies can, uh, can differ between municipalities and between uh, jurisdictions. Uh, I'm just actually looking for this, and I apologize, I, I don't have the section number ahead of me on uh, protection from liability for counselors. Megan, you wouldn't happen to know which section that is. I work through three different statutes all the time, and uh, I don't want to go I... wrong, the wrong section here. 92 is coming to mind, but I, I might be wrong. <laughs> yeah, 355, here it is. Oh, way off, okay. There we go, I knew it was just somewhere. So uh, yeah, it's a good question. And there is protection uh, from liability provided for uh, municipal council members and council committees. And, and I'll just read from the section. It says, no action or proceeding lies or shall be instituted against, you gotta love this legal language, against a member of council, a member of a council committee or any other body established by council member of a public utility board, et cetera, et cetera. Then it goes on to talk about uh, municipal officers, volunteer workers and agents. For any loss or damage suffered by a person by reason of anything done in good faith, caused, permitted, sorry, caused, permitted or authorized to be done, attempted to be done or omitted, pursuant to or in the exercise or supposed exercise of any power confirmed by this act, regulations or carrying out the supposed carrying out of duties, et cetera, et cetera. What does that really mean? Uh, the important things there are uh, it has to be done in good faith and has to be done in the intended performance or, or expected performance of powers, duties, and functions conferred by the act or bylaws. And so, um, you know, that's a pretty powerful protection provided to, to elected officials and to municipal officers. And that good faith thing is really important. And the, and the question always comes up, well, what's good faith? And the law is a little bit difficult in that it doesn't really define for us. The law usually says things like, well, good faith means there's no bad faith. Well, that's not particularly helpful. Um, what we're talking about are things is willful disregard, um, you know, gross negligence, um, actions taken for this, you know, for the purpose of causing harm, things like that. Um, if you are attempting to exercise your duties, the act protects you even if you miss the mark, as long as you are acting in good faith. Um, the example I like to give all the time is if, uh, if you are the mayor and you are taking action as, as a mayor uh, against somebody who ran against you and lost as mayor, uh, and that's the motivation for the actions you're taking, that's probably not good faith. If you're a counsel and you've been told by your legal counsel, you know, your legal advisors, that something that you're proposing to do is illegal offside the act and you do it anyways, that's probably not good faith. But beyond that, the protection is actually very, very broad. Um, the thing that people need to, to recognize though is that that is protection for municipal officers and counselors. It doesn't mean the municipality itself may not be liable for the actions taken by, by the council members. Um, so that's something to be borne in mind. The municipality itself may still be liable, but the counselors uh, or municipal officers may be protected. And that, that uh, section 355 is common in Alberta and Saskatchewan and up in the territories as well. That language is, is pretty prevalent uh, throughout the legislation for municipalities. Uh, perfect. Does anyone have anything else to add? If not, we will move on. Our next question is also for you, Derek. Is there a private law duty for counselors to enforce bylaws? Uh, 
No, there is no private law duty for counselors to enforce bylaws. Um, okay. Counselors should not be enforcing bylaws. That is an operational okay. action. Counselors may carry forward concerns raised by uh, the ratepayers that they represent, uh, may even see things themselves that seem to be offside, you know, an unsightly property, uh, dogs that, you know, or animals that aren't being kept in accordance with bylaws or what have you. And their job is to bring it to the attention of administration and let administration make a determination on how to, uh, how to deal with that bylaw matter. Perfect. Uh, our next question is for Yvonne and Linda. Um, do you have any experience with holding your annual meeting via Zoom? We've only done council meetings over Zoom. I can't imagine what it would be like to have, I don't know, to give you an example, we did during COVID in April, my parents had their 50th anniversary. And so we did, we thought we'll have a Zoom tea party. Well, that was a disaster with a bunch of 70 year old people trying to figure out how to do Zoom. <laughs> So I just envision that with an annual meeting over Zoom. So unless everybody knows how to use it, I can't imagine it would be great. But that's just my experience with the groups. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that, Yvonne. I literally just went through exactly the same uh, experience for a 75th birthday party. Uh, unmitigated disaster. <laughs> so it could be difficult to hold it that way for sure. I had the same experience at Easter and um, it involved family from Denmark to Vancouver to home and it entailed my young nephews and nieces telling jokes the majority of the time talking over one another. Uh, but just to clarify on annual meetings, an annual meeting is not fired by council uh, from legislation unless it's written for. Your council may choose to hold them which are excellent opportunities to communicate with your public but because of the parameters that we're under with the restrictions for public gatherings and maybe Zoom might not be the right idea for a, an annual public meeting, consider your other options of how to communicate. So whether you have a, a municipal website, uh, a fa Facebook page, uh, if you do a newsletter, um, things like that uh, might be a good way of providing that transparency and openness that your, your public desires, but maybe not over a, a video meeting platform. So uh, we have a really good follow up to that as well. And I apologize, my camera has adjusted the lighting so I look like a shadow. But um, if your online meeting is announced and your council and administrator are experiencing technical difficulties that prevent you going live, can the meeting proceed or does it need to be rescheduled? Is that me? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah i apologize um, and yeah we'll direct no, that to you megan okay. anyone else want to jump in you're fine um <laughs> really the biggest thing is that that meeting has to be public so if you cannot provide that meeting through uh publicly available then yes you're best to stop and reschedule to have that meeting if it's affecting the attendance of council uh then that also deals with quorum so a council of five and uh, the quorum would be three. But if three or four, or I guess all of them, then you don't have quorum, then you don't have a meeting. So it really just comes down to having quorum and it's still being publicly available. If not, then you're best to, to reschedule it. Perfect. Um, does anyone else want to speak about this or uh, Yvonne or Linda, if you have any experiences uh, running into technical difficulties while you're doing your council meetings? We haven't with Zoom, so and we we uh, we've been using like before. Well, when some counselors before this Zoom, we were doing uh, by phone, and we've never had we've never had any difficulties with it so far. <laughs> we do post on our uh, we post on our website that there is a Zoom meeting and uh, how they can access it through the administrator to get in on our, our council meetings if people, if the public would like to. So, uh, but so far we haven't really had anybody ever um, declare that they were interested in it and becoming, you know, going on Zoom to be part of our meetings.
Perfect. Thank you, Linda. Um, our next question, which I believe would go to Megan and or Derek, uh, is there any reason why a council would refuse a referendum on annexation? Do you want me to jump in, Megan? Um, yeah, there, one of the most obvious reason would be that uh, the, uh, the petition for it, uh, uh, and let me, actually, let me just read the question, make sure I'm not misinterpreting the question. Oh, okay. So the, the way that this would typically come forward to council would be by uh, petition. And uh, the petition would have to meet certain uh, requirements. And if it didn't meet those requirements, then council can, uh, can disregard the, uh, well, they're not obligated to take action. They can still make a decision, well, we want to move forward anyways. But basically what I'm referring to here is um, under section 132, um, a council that receives a petition requesting a referendum signed by the greater of 15% of the population or 25 voters of the municipality shall submit the request for a referendum to a vote in accordance. Um, so um, if you didn't have that right off the bat, you wouldn't uh, take that matter forward. Um, you could take it under advisement, but uh, you wouldn't be obligated to take it forward. Um, typically what you're gonna see though is a petition for a referendum. You're not gonna usually see it asking for a vote. You're gonna see it saying, you know, on an annexation uh, or amalgamation, we want uh, we want council to pursue this, and it may be just directive anyways. In which case, if it doesn't meet the requirements of the act for a petition that triggers a necessary action by council, then it again can only be taken. It may only be taken under advisement. So those are the factors. The, really, the, the starting point is: does it meet the requirements for a petition under Section One Thirty Two? And if it doesn't, then then no action is triggered. Megan, you probably want to add to that. No. Okay. It's basically it's uh, the, the sufficiency, and that's yes, what's sufficient. determined as per 132, and the administrator determines that sufficiency and then presents it to council. Uh, yeah. Perfect. It looks like we have uh, a hand up from Joe uh, Joza. Um, so we'll get Katie to enable you to talk here. Um, we just ask that you keep your question brief, as we only have about eight minutes left here and uh, a couple more questions to go through. Uh, so, Joe, right now you're muted. If you just want to unmute yourself, um, you can ask your question. I, I have my question answered already. Thank you. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Um, our next question is for uh, Megan. What happens if there's less than a full slate of candidates for the election? So, uh, if there is less than a full slate, place after the first call of nominations, then the returning officer will put out a second call. If at that time there still is not enough um, nominations to fill the vacancies, they'll have to take it back to their council to schedule a by-election and set a date for that. Um, I guess that in the grand scheme of things, that there's still difficulty in filling that position, uh, they may look to changing the composition of council. So say you have a council of seven, and you're having a hard time fill, filling two or three of those positions, you may consider uh, reducing the size of your council down the road. That's kind of a bigger picture um, option, but in the case of short term, it's a second call for nominations, and if not, they schedule another by-election. Perfect, uh, thank you. I'm sorry, I'm just gonna keep hitting you with the questions, but uh, <laughs> the next okay. one is how many meetings are required per year, and can there be more if needed? Uh, what role do resort villages have in terms of lake water quality? Um, the meetings required per year, I'd have to double check. There were amendments made to the Municipalities Act that received royal assent on the 3rd of July. So very recent. And if I recall, um, I don't want to speak out of turn, but I believe it's once every three months or four months. I'd have to double check that. Um, but as a member of council, you are required to um, attend regular meetings at at least two, you cannot miss more than two consecutive meetings scheduled over three months, and those are regular meetings. Um, there can be more council meetings. I think I mentioned earlier about special meetings can be called at um, the direction of the mayor or by authority of council, directing the council to call a special meeting. Um, in terms of 
resort villages and water quality. Um, that's really lobbying the the ministry responsible for water quality. So Ministry of Environment or working with your watersheds, um, water security agency as a level of government and, and, and pursuing it with those other levels, I guess really is where that role comes into play. Anything else to add, Derek? Did I miss anything on meetings? I'm not sure if you're familiar with the uh, amendment at this point. Uh, no, I, you know, I candidly am not, um, but no, I have nothing else to add to that. Uh, perfect. Uh, I will note, so we have four questions left in five minutes. So if all the panelists are okay, we'll just go slightly over. Uh, if you have to run, just let me know and uh, we'll do what we can. Um, our next question is for Derek. What about volunteers? Are they covered under liability insurance or is just council? And do you need a volunteer committee for them to be covered? Um, well, if they're on a committee, then, then uh, they're covered by the protection of the legislation. There are, the protection does extend to volunteers under the legislation as well, generally. Um, I can't speak to whether they're covered by insurance. And, and the reason for that is uh, I don't practice in the, insur in the municipal insurance area. We, we break our practices up so that everybody has a certain skill set. But we don't try to be masters of all areas of municipal law because, frankly, it's impossible to do that. It's just too broad. So the, the short answer is I don't know. Uh, it would depend on what the insurance policy actually said. Um, I have seen files where insurance seems to be in place for, for volunteers in the past, but uh, it, uh, I can't say definitively that that would always be the case under every municipality's insurance policy. I'm sorry, I, I just don't have an answer for you on that. Uh, perfect. Thank you, Derek. And so just looking at the other questions, um, someone is interested in just a follow up on uh, the enforcement of by uh, bylaws from you, Derek, you said that it's not council who decides about enforcement, but administration. So they're just looking for a little more clarity on that. Sure. Um, yeah, and I think the question after that was even a follow up to that previous to that question. But um, the thing to understand with respect to enforcement is a couple things. First, it's that division between council and administration. So council may establish policies relating to enforcement. And they may be things like, uh, you know, and these will weigh out social, economic, personnel factors. You know, they have the challenges that council has to weigh out when it makes policy decisions. And so you might have a policy, for example, that states that, um, that um, by law enforcement will only occur on a complaint driven basis, that there won't be any kind of proactive looking for, for enforcement. Uh, and that's the kind of thing that council will do. They'll establish general policies, hopefully in a way that, that maintains discretion of the of administration to actually implement that policy. And then administration has, as I, as I said, the implementational responsibility, the operational side. Uh, bylaw enforcement officers may be employed or there may be somebody uh, like the CAO who carries that, wears that hat as well, uh, who may be responsible for actually implementing that policy. As well, the law generally establishes that municipalities have broad discretion with respect to whether to enforce bylaws and how to enforce those bylaws, subject to certain exceptions. When we start getting into significant safety things, uh, situations, then that discretion may be more, uh, more narrow. But generally speaking, the legislation and the case law establishes that municipalities have broad discretion on, on how to enforce and, and whether to enforce. Um, how that gets implemented again is going to be at the operational level. Um, and that will be individual bylaw officers working in, a, in accordance with policies established by the municipality uh, at the council level. And you know, enforcement can take a very broad scope. And, and this is something I can speak to with some, some authority because uh, a big portion of my practice is municipal enforcement, which I've been doing for about 23 years now. And uh, you know, enforcement can take, it can be education, it can be uh, warning letters, it can be violation tickets, it can be the issuance of orders under the legislation to compel compliance. But again, there's that very broad, uh, that broad discretion. Um, so the short answer is, um, is council makes general policies on how enforcement generally may be addressed in the municipality. Uh, uh, administration implements that and, and carries it out and deals with it on a case by case basis. Um, I think the question then went on to saying, yeah, but practically it doesn't happen that way. No, I, rec I recognize that. Uh, council members and councils do get involved, uh, but that can be challenging uh, because that's not their role. And so 
Uh, I've had files, for example, where we've taken enforcement action uh, in the case of, a, of an order, for example, that was issued where the, the designated officer of the municipality was required to issue the order. We went to questioning uh, because we're going to court to defend that order. And the question was asked, well, how did you make the determination that the property was dangerous and unsightly? And the answer was, well, I frankly didn't. Council told me it was. And uh, at that point, we just politely folded up our binders and, and exited the questioning because our case was over, because that's not council's decision. Um, so these are the things that council needs to be aware of. And, and part of that is, is educating council, like we're doing today, on uh, what council's actual role is in, uh, in the municipality. So, you know, it's impossible to completely avoid having, uh, um, having council members get involved in, in or at least push on, uh, on uh, getting bylaw matters dealt with because they're hearing from the public. But uh, it's important to recognize that that is in council's role. Now, I've talked too long. I know we, all, we want to wrap up, so I apologize for that. Uh, it's all good. Um, our final question is just for Linda and Yvonne, and it's just to follow up on that water quality question. Uh, Someone was just looking for uh, your experiencing in managing resort village water quality, boat traffic, and kind of other things like that. So uh, if you just want to speak to kind of what it's been like for your uh, resort village, that would be great. Uh, for the resort village of Melba Beach here, uh, our, we do not have a public well that uh, for most people have their own wells in there and septic tanks. So um, we do not have that, uh, I guess, that concern with our community. Um, <clears throat> what was the other one on there? Um, there's water quality and what was the other one? Uh, uh, boat, oh, boat traffic was the, the question oh, boat they had. traffic, yeah. That's, that's a big one here too. Come the weekends, there's always concerns about uh, not only boat traffic, but also like public swimming. And um, um, I guess the things we've, we've asked for, uh, um, we, the provincial parks, um, having the air officers come and with, um, take a look at too. But I mean, it's, uh, there is bylaws in there in terms of how far people are out with their, uh, their boats to be offshore. And we have got the boys out there, but um, that's basically all we have at this point. And if we have concerns, I guess, you know, um, to call in the, uh, uh, the RCMP down here. I don't think we really have anything different in Mistossany either. The boat launch is always an issue. Um, mm -hmm. There's just way too much traffic um, mm -hmm. for the capacity there. And the beach, um, mm -hmm. they've got a, we've got a bylaw in place about where the swimming beaches are and having it, you know, a certain distance from the boat launch, trying to keep um, people away from the boat launch area just to keep it a little more safe. Um, water quality, we don't have any just jurisdiction over the lake. Um, that's the like um, Megan said, the water security agency or the watershed authority. Um, we have been um supportive of the um, group that's working to monitor the aquatic invasive species like zebra mussels and that we want to protect our lake um so that's kind of the approach we've taken around that but um yeah in terms of uh, water oh, water one. quality of the lake it's very difficult because um like yvonne said we've you know, in terms of the zebra mussels, we are, you know, keeping watch on that. <clears throat> but um, with our lake, of course, in the Copal Valley, it's the algae that's always a big concern for us. And right now, um, I'm not sure much could be done. <laughs> Sean, just to very quickly add to that, if I can. Um, and this question may have been driven by uh, provisions in the Municipalities Act that give uh, municipalities um, the ability to regulate activities on river streams and water courses under section 46 and uh, this is this is something that's also common in legislation in other provinces as well and it's always an interesting challenge um, not just for resort villages but all municipalities but even more so for resort villages 
uh, first in that, unlike say a, a rural municipality where you might fully encompass a lake, a resort village may only encompass a portion of a lake. And so there may be competing jurisdiction over that water uh, under section 46. But as well, this is an area that's also subject to provincial and federal regulation. So uh, municipalities do have some ability to, to, uh, to regulate the water body, but it has to be in completely consistent in conjunction with federal regulations over um, uh, voyage systems, uh, navigable waters, uh, tra uh, boater safety and things like that. And then the provincial overriding legislation with you know, the environmental and the water legislation that is there as well. So it's always a bit of a challenge and we see this uh, all the, this is a question that comes up a lot for resort municipalities uh, and summer villages, resort villages and summer villages, which is what they call them in Alberta. Uh, it's kind of the same challenge in both, in both jurisdictions is trying to find that balance. And so um, it's important to recognize that the municipality, because of section 46, does not have carte blanche to simply go out there and put bylaws in place and restrict voter traffic or areas of the lake that can be used. There is some jurisdiction, but it's not, uh, it's not, all, not all encompassing. Perfect. Well, I want to thank uh, all of our panelists today. Um, if there are follow-up questions after this, we will make sure that you have the contact information of uh, our panelists or uh, their designates so that you can get the answers to any questions you may have. Uh, this brings us to the end of today's presentation, and I want to thank everyone for those great questions. We definitely were able to fill the whole hour and a half, and uh, this session definitely exceeded our expectations for engagement. So we are really thankful to all our resort villages who uh, shared this session with residents and all the residents who uh, decided to come out and ask questions about what it's like to become a counselor. Uh, you will all be receiving a recording of this presentation over the next few days, as well as a PDF of the PowerPoint. And if you're interested in sending this to anyone, there will be a public link to the YouTube video of this, uh, which you'll be able to share with any other residents interested in running. Uh, please take a few minutes to fill out this short survey so we can improve our upcoming events and learn how to improve this session. Uh, thank you again to our panelists. Uh, your insight was really good and uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to uh, be with us over your lunch hour and uh, I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Sean, everyone. Thanks again, thanks again, yeah, for the opportunity <laughs> to sponsor this. We really appreciate it. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Thanks.